Hey everyone, Diavolo here, and in today's video, we are going over the next arc in Gigi Kotami's mental mind trip of a story that is Jujutsu Kaisen. This perfect preparation arc is actually peak Gigi writing, as it starts to kick things off in terms of the culling game and gives us way more of an understanding with how things are going to go down throughout it. The amount of new characters, abilities, and just pure freaking hype is amazing. Like the girls go so damn hard in this arc, it's, it's just too good. Now obviously enough of me creaming over Father Gige and his holy scriptures. Obviously if you are new around here and want more story type explained content just like this, then be sure to hit that subscribe button and also be sure to leave a like on the video, as it really helps out with pushing my stuff to a bunch of new amazing people. But anyway, sit back and relax as we dive straight back into Jujutsu Kaisen. So a quick reminder to everyone is that obviously this arc literally picks up where things finished right at the end of the last one, with Yuji, Yuta, Megami and all of them in a conversation over the culling game and the implications around it. With Megami's sister having been revealed to be caught up in the culling game, Fushiguro, like the best friend he is, tells Yuji to let go of his past mistakes and the things he can't control to instead help save his sister now. Thinking about his grandfather's final words, Yuji comes up with a compromise. He instead asks Yuta to kill him in the event that Sukuna should ever take over his body again. Yuji believes that the big man Nikotsu is stocky enough to be able to take him down, to which the second year agrees, saying that he'll do what he can. So after the agreement, Megami lays out the plan to them. They first need to contact Tengen and find out how to actually unseal Gojo and what Brain Kun's objectives truly are. The game itself is a form of Jujutsu terrorism on a scale that has never been seen before, and Megami believes that they need answers to aforementioned questions. Yuji asks if Yuki would know, to which Megami reveals that this was her idea. And obviously this goes to prove that instead of the higher ups like I said in the previous video, it was actually Megami that she was, you know, in contact with. It's shown that Yuki is hiding at Jujutsu High currently and waiting for them while trying to avoid the higher ups there. Yuta goes on to say that there is a problem with contacting Tengen. Due to the recent events back in the Gojo past arc, Tengen's concealing barrier is active and shuffles over 1000 doors continuously, with only one leading to him. Yuji interrupts and asks what the situation with Nobara is, but only gets an encouraging, saddened look as a response from his boy. Trying to contain his emotions, Yuji leans over and also looks to the ground, while repeating, I get it. Chosu, who I somehow forgot to mention was still around because he's my boy, abruptly makes it known that he may know a way past. Yuji asks what he means, and Chosu reminds them on how Mahito had stolen some of Sukuna's fingers and death paintings from Jujutsu in the past, then goes on to say that he thinks he can do the same thing. Skipping forward, all four of the boys, which by the way, like what a freaking goated group right here, they all enter the school in secret, and meets with Yuki and Maki inside. Seeing Maki for the first time since Shibuya, it's obvious that she's visibly taken a freaking beating from her fight with Jogo and Dagon there, even after Shoko's reverse curse technique, her body is still severely mutilated. Concerned for her, Yuda goes up to Maki and asks if it's okay for her to be moving. Seeing this though, Yuki explains to him that a reverse curse technique can't actually prevent scars from burns. Maki was literally only able to survive Jogo's flames because of the physical durability granted to her through her heavenly restriction. Maki then asks Megami about their plan to slip past the concealing barrier. Choso, like the big pro he is, volunteers to inform the group and explains that between the correct door and the tomb is a cursed warehouse where his brothers are currently being stored. His connection to them will allow him to guide everyone to the correct door. Maki is satisfied with the plan, but she needs clarification on who exactly Choso is. After a brief silence, Yuji reluctantly tells everyone just to think of Choso as his big brother for now. Which, like, oh my lord, Choso must have had like fireworks go off inside of his head or something. Like, even in reality, he's visibly shocked and excited to finally hear that Yuji is saying his name. Skipping forward, Choso guides the group to the correct door, confident that his brother slept beyond it. Yuji is surprised to find that there is no solar path beyond the doors, just a massive drop into a forested area filled with tall old trees. After Yuki tells them to move forward in search of the elevator, the group walks past a warehouse where Choso stops for a moment. He reluctantly touches the door and asks his brothers to just wait a little longer for him to return and save them. Honestly, I want to meet Shoso, who's one of either Choso's brothers or sisters. I feel like it's got to be a goated female version of Choso. Like, honestly, we just, we got to have her in the series as well if Choso was this cool. After the group takes the elevator down to the Tomb of the Star, Yuji notices bloodstains on the ground and asks what happened. 
Nuki says that it's the remains of when everything in the Jujutsu world began to distort, even picturing the demon himself, Fushiguro, in her mind. After a moment, Yuki moves on and leads them directly to the main shrine, and once there, they walk into nothing but a completely stark white void. With everyone confused, Yuki says Tengen is currently rejecting them. Normally, the entity doesn't interact with the world, but Yuki thought contact may have been possible now that Gojo has been sealed. She also considers the possibility that Tengen isn't rejecting everyone and instead just her. This is, you know, obviously just due to the fact that she has her own agenda and in some ways wouldn't mind knocking off all of the higher ups just like Gojo. Unsure of what to do, Yuta tells everyone that they should head back since Megami's sister doesn't have time to waste. Suddenly, a voice rings out and asks, why are they all leaving so soon? The thumb of an entity then appears. Master Tengen finally reveals himself while saying it's a pleasure to meet the children of the Zenin family. Michizane's descendant, which I, I really hope I didn't botch because it always sounds so freaking weird in my head, the death painting womb, and finally, Sukuna's vessel. While everyone else is surprised by Tengen's thumb-like shape, Yuki asks why Tengen didn't address her in their greeting. Tengen replies that this isn't the first time they've met. Yuki's next question is why the Tomb of the Star was closed. To which it's revealed, Tengen is unable to see into the human heart and feared that Yuki was aligned with Kenjaku. Finally, like, oh my god, I can stop calling him by the 900 names I keep giving him, as it's explained through Tengen here that Kenjaku is the real name of the body switching entity that was once known as Noritoshi Keimo and now inhabits the body of Suguru Geto. Yuji, like the absolute melon head he is, cuts in on the conversation to ask why Tengen looks so freaking weird. While Megumi stands there surprised with Yuji, Tengen explains that even though his curse technique grants a form of immortality, it's not anti-aging. 11 years ago when the Star Plasma Vessel failed, Tengen's aging process accelerated, and the self-awareness it had as an individual diminished. Therefore, it was forced to evolve, and now technically has become one with the world itself. Which is a lot to take in and has so many implications in this story that have like even yet to be explained. Like what even is this evolution he was meant to go through? Like why was it considered bad in the Gojo past arc if he didn't assimilate when now he can still control the barriers and all of that kind of stuff? Anyways, anyways, Mikimi and Yuta get to the point and ask about Kenjaku's objectives along with unsealing Gojo from the prison realm. Tengen goes on to say that he will provide information on one condition. At least two of the three people present that are special grade must remain at the Tomb of the Star to serve as guards. Since the lot are kind of confused as to why, Tenkin explains that Kenjaku wants to force the evolution of all of the people in Japan. But he can't do this while Tenkin's barriers are active, because that requires an insane amount of cursed energy. Starting an evolution of that scale using a cursed technique is utterly inefficient. Instead, the method Kenjaku has chosen is to merge Tenkin with mankind itself. Since evolving into this new state, it is now possible for Tengen to merge with someone who isn't the Star Plasma Vessel. Any human who merges with the Tengen evolves into something beyond a sorcerer that is both there and not part of the physical realm at the same time. Tengen stabilized and maintained self-control even after evolving thanks to the barrier techniques, but says the world would end if anyone merges with him. It's explained that there would be no boundaries between individuals and the impurities of millions of humans would flood the entire world. What happened to Tokyo would engulf the entire planet, resulting in a world of cursed spirits. What's actually insane is that Tengen also can't refuse the merger because the failed assimilation has caused them to turn into more of a cursed spirit than a human being which is obviously a perfect target for someone with curse manipulation. So Kenjaku's plan is finally revealed. Honestly though, like the amount of time that must have gone into this plan and setting up it in preparation and getting all the people that he needs to get it must have been absolutely freaking mental. Anyways, due to the threat of Kenjaku coming to unseal the tomb, the corridor is rejecting everyone that approaches. Hence, you know, like the white room. Kenjaku was the one who set the plan in motion that stopped the merger 11 years ago. It was also involved with Sukuna over a thousand years ago, to which Yuki wonders why is he making a move just now. It's said that the Tengen, Star Plasma Vessel, and Six Eyes are connected by fate. Kenjaku has been defeated by two different Six Eyes users in the past, and after his second defeat, he managed to kill the Star Plasma Vessel and the next Six Eyes user the day after they were born. Yet despite all of these efforts, they still somehow appeared on the day of the merger with Tengen. 
being left at a dead end made him switch to the method of sealing the six eyes instead of attempting to eradicate it completely. However, in a turn of fate that neither Tengen or Kenjaku ever expected, 11 years ago, the heavenly gifted demon Toji Fushiguro intervened. A man who escaped curse energy entirely and therefore was not bound by the chains of fate that affected the Jujutsu world. In effect, Toji destroyed the destinies that bound Tengen, the star plasma vessel and the six eyes. Then along with Toji came Suguru Geto, a boy who just happened to be able to manipulate cursed spirits. Then, after what could have been a thousand years worth of research, Kenjaku secured the prison realm six years ago, and all his plans fell into place. So in all actuality, this game is a ritual to ready the people of Japan for a massive merger with Tengen. It uses the player's cursed energy and their barriers to transfer everyone to the other side. Through these weird vow like customs, Tengen can be forced to merge with all of humanity. In order to pull off something of this level, Kenjaku has restricted himself with these binding vows. One stipulates that he is not the game master, so even killing him will not end the game. Instead, the only way that it can end is once all of the players are dead and there are rules in place to ensure that nothing can interrupt the original ritual. The other best possible course of action for them would be to expend 100 points to add rules where Megumi's sister and others who are unwilling to participate can escape the game. Freeing Satoru Gojo would also be extremely ideal, but before Tengen reveals how they're able to do this, it requires the group to pick two of them to serve as guards. Oh my god, like big thumb dropping a truckload of freaking insane information that changes the entire landscape of the world. Like, it truly goes to show how much time and effort has gone into this plan on Kenjaku's side. E even now, if he dies, his plan is still in place and he expects that he will come out on top no matter what. Following this, Yuki and Choso volunteer themselves as Choso knows Yuji will need Yuta's help and this will also give him a chance to protect his brothers should Kenjaku come for Tengen here. Yuhi also isn't finished talking with Tengen either way, and would like to stay back if that's mint with the others. Wanting to be around everyone else, Yuta happily agrees with the plan. After thanking them, Tengen then proceeds to take out the back of the prison realm, explaining that it is a separate cursed object that will be necessary in unsealing Gojo. After Kenjaku found the front, he hid the back, but Kenjaku now bears complete authority over the prison realm as the bearer of the front gate, and can block them from accessing the back. Breaking it open is instead the only way, and would require curse tools that can cancel curse techniques, like the inverted spear of heaven or the black rope. However, both of those were lost in separate battles with Gojo. So, like, obviously for those who don't know what these are, it's the blade that Toji used in his fight with Gojo 11 years earlier in the Gojo Past arc, and the black rope that Miguel used against Gojo during the night parade of a hundred demons in Jujutsu Kaisen Zero. But you know, anyways, anyways. In an attempt to look for more of like that rope, Yuta had already been searching in Africa with Miguel, but sadly to no avail as it takes centuries for them to create something like it. However, there is still one way to get into the back of the prison realm. A thousand years ago, there was a female sorcerer who called herself Angel. She possessed a curse technique that could extinguish others' curse techniques, pretty much nullifying them. Her name is Hanakurasu, and she's been incarnated as a culling game player. Honestly, this character poses so much of like a curveball to the game. Why has Kenjaku decided to also revive or bring back this sorcerer? What's the specifications around her coming back and being a part of this game? There has to be some like reasoning behind it, allowing someone who would like pose a threat to the integrity of the game to come back and participate in the first place. Seems kind of whack, you know? Tengen repeats that Angel's technique will be necessary to open the back of the prison realm. With everyone confused, Megumi asks where Angel is, and Tengen can only say that she is in the colony on the east side of Tokyo. It is then shown that there are 10 colonies that are connected by barriers that form a line down Japan. This line of barriers will merge everyone in Japan with the Tengen and transfer them to the other side. Hokkaido isn't actually included because it's already been established as a sacred area that has been assimilated. Which is like, what do you mean by that? Is Hokkaido reminiscent of ancient Japan in regards to the cursed spirits and fights that are currently going on there? Anyways, anyways. This whole mental idea of evolving humanity by merging the Watengen's current state is extremely complex and sounds somewhat exaggerated. However, this is only a testament to how serious the situation actually is. 
Tengen then reveals that a curse had in secret merged with every single person in Japan in preparation for the merger and believes it will now only take about two months to fully complete the ritual. The group then goes over the rules of the Cullen game once again. The first rule states that players must declare their participation at any colony of their choice within 19 days. Currently, it's 9am on the 9th of November, and all players have awakened their curse techniques around midnight on the 31st of October, which was when Kenjaku initiated the countrywide idol transfiguration. This only gives Megami's sister 10 days and 15 hours to declare participation in the Culling Game. The second rule states that anyone who breaks the first rule will be subject to curse technique removal. Maki had previously talked with Shoko about this rule of the game, believing that curse technique removal implies that it's not through idle transfiguration or a binding vow, but instead she thinks that it must be something that must happen to the user's brain, which would in turn kill them. As if it was a vow, all players could simply refuse participation. Tenkin confirms Shoko's theory, meaning that people like Maki, who currently don't even possess cursed energy, aren't actually at a risk of dying. Rule number 3 explains that anyone who enters a colony after the games have begun will be considered an official participant. Civilians inside the barriers will be given one chance to exit, and there are currently no rules about entering or exiting colonies. When the game starts, players will be given an incentive to move towards the colony exits. This serves as an incentive to stimulate participation, as in order to confine players effectively, they must believe they entered the games of their own free will. The fourth rule is the one that states players score points by killing one another. The fifth one specifies that each player's points value is determined by the game master. Currently sorcerers are worth 5 points and non-sorcerers are worth 1. Having just heard of this game master, Tengen explains to them that each player receives a Shikigami known as Kogain. This creature serves as the game's interface while the game master serves as the program that runs it in some way. Obviously this concept is super confusing as Gege is on his astral shit, like even Yuji is left in a comically lost state. Rule 6 states that players can spend 100 of their own scored points to negotiate a new rule in the game. These rules can't be subtracted, but Megami thinks they might be able to create other rules as roundabout ways to counter the original ones without disrupting the game. In accordance with Rule 6, Rule 7 states that the game master must accept any new rule as long as it doesn't have a long lasting effect on the game. The group wonders if the rules are fair, but Tengen assures them that Kenjaku receives no bias towards himself with these rules, and they can expect to be treated fairly, just like any other player. The eighth and final rule states that a player will be subject to curse technique removal if their score does not change for 19 days. This causes Yuji to worry about whether or not he'll have to kill others, but again Megami suggests that he might have a few ways around that. With all the information thoroughly reviewed, Maki then begins to go over everyone's role. Yuki and Choso will remain at the Tomb of the Star, while our girl Maki will return to the Zenin Clan to collect the missing cursed tools. Now that Megami is the Zenin Clan's leader, Maki will be able to use this to her advantage to get them. Maki then inquires about the location of Juzo Kamiya's workshop, which she will go to before recruiting Panda to the group. This Juzo dude in his workshop is the guy that Gakuganji fought and the one that Gojo later absolutely mangled like broke all his limbs. They must have interrogated him for the location of his workshop where he made all his f weird ass tools and stuff. Anyway, anyway, Yuta will instantly take part in the culling game to gather information long before Megami's sister and the others have to join. Yuji will try to avoid nearby colonies to prevent collateral damage in case something happens, but because of this he might be out of touch since the barriers likely block phone reception. He quickly realises this presents an issue as Yuji asks Yuta to kill him should Sukuna ever appear again. They both think for a moment until Megami says that Yuta can just kill Yuji if he dies first, but Yuji wants to try and prevent Megami's death in the first place. Maki tells Yuji and Megami that their role is to find Hikari Kinji, the suspended third year, and to recruit him to their group. Despite his moody attitude, Hikari is apparently insanely tough, with Yuta going as far as to say that when he's riled up, Hikari surpasses everyone, even him, in strength. After this, everyone finally moves out, but not before Yuji thanks Choso for everything he has done so far. And while he waves goodbye, his big bro tells him to not go dine on him out there. Meanwhile, at probably a similar time in a random comedy club called The Public Stand, everyone sits around bored with an act that's obviously bombing on stage like the man visibly sucks ass at comedy. His name anyway turns out to be Fumihiko Takaba. 
His mate tells the 35 year old Takaba to quit because he's simply not cut out for the job. This massive Japanese dude who just happens to be in the corner says he doesn't mind his dumb jokes. He thinks there are two types of comedians who will always be in demand. Comics who are funny and comics who wholeheartedly believe that they are funny. Ken, who's the massive Japanese dude, asks Takaba which of the two he believes he is. Takaba says it's 50-50 at first before receiving a strange impulse, then deciding to change his answer to 70-30. Well, 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 hasn't Nanami's technique revived itself and someone else? I don't know, just the thought, I, I love the idea that it could possibly be the reincarnation of Nanami's technique, or at least I hope it is anyway. Skipping back to a moment shortly after Panda's birth, Masamichi is seen confined in his cell, with both of his hands bound. It's explained through Gekuganji that it's normal for a cursed corpse to operate independently as they usually consume cursed energy provided by its user. In comparison, Panda is a self-supporting cursed corpse that can generate his own cursed energy, pretty much like the man literally created life itself. Because of this, the higher ups were in the process of designating him as a special grade and actually imposing him with an indefinite restraint. After stating this to him, Gekuganji asked how Panda was made. But Masamichi insisted that he didn't know. Now in the present, Yaga is on the run but chilling in a forest with one of his dolls. The cursed corpse is able to talk and calls out to Masamichi saying everyone is worried about how gloomy he's become. Masamichi pats his head and reveals that he won't be able to return anytime soon, adding that Master Tenkin protects the forest they are currently hiding in. After saying he'll be fine on his own, they head over to a tree where Yaga opens a small door. Inside, many of his small, harmless, independent cursed corpses reside. Knowing that they will never see him again, they tell him they will all miss him. Meanwhile, inside the isolation holding chamber at Jujutsu High, Kuzukabe uses his katana to cut Panda free. He goes on to say that he is doing this as a favour to repay Masamichi, but makes sure to tell Panda to not reveal who helped him. Flashing back to the past once again, we learn that Masamichi created an independent cursed corpse with Kuzukabe's nephew's sole information. Kuzukabe's sister had lost her son and couldn't live on without the support that he was providing her. One day, when she was brought to Yaga, a small, dog-like doll asked if that woman was his mother, then goes on to say he's a genius after being confirmed right by Yaga. Kuzukabe's sister immediately recognises her son's mannerisms and instantly darts out of her catatonic state to embrace him. After the two console each other, Masamichi explains that he couldn't allow Takaru, which is the real child's name, like not the doll but like the real child, to live with his mother as he couldn't risk it getting out that a fully independent curse corpse existed. Even still, Kusakabe apologised and emotionally expressed his gratitude towards Masamichi for doing so. By the way, this whole moment that just happened was actually before Panda was even born. I forgot to mention that, but it probably makes a bit more sense on how the fact that no one knew an independent curse corpse existed at the time. Back in the present day, Yaga is confronted by an unknown sorcerer. He asks where Masamichi is going without any of his cursed corpses to back him up. While removing his jacket like the freaking absolute beast he is, the principal simply replies that he is going to see his son. The sorcerer is left slightly confused as he doesn't know what Masamichi means but goes on to explain the severity of the current situation the principal finds himself in. He says the only way to save himself now is to reveal how to create independent cursed corpses immediately. Masamichi says that his adversaries have gotten comfortable getting pushy without Gojo around, to which the sorcerer agrees, especially as he's been accompanied by a veteran sorcerer. On cue, Gakuganji suddenly steps out of the shadows and deals Masamichi a fatal blow to his chest, shattering the electric guitar and leaving him mortally wounded with two deep cuts across his front forming an X shape that also splatters blood alongside the wall. Yakuganji tells the sorcerer accompanying him to leave the two principals alone, then with his last words, Masamichi suddenly begins explaining exactly how to create independent cursed corpses. He states that his soul's information can be replicated from physical information and inputted into cursed corpses' cores. These cores must contain three highly compatible souls which are always observing each other. This is the only way souls will stabilise and give rise to self-awareness and self-sustaining cursed energy. Confused and shocked by all of this, Gakuganji asks why Masamichi would tell him now instead of trying to live by revealing this earlier. Just then, before passing away, Masamichi replies that it's a curse being passed on from him to Gakuganji. Instantly after, Panda arrives only moments too late, just as Masamichi dies. 
Gakuganji throws down the broken remains of his weapon in anticipation for Panda to retaliate. However, Panda simply walks straight past him towards Masamichi without so much as ever glancing at Gakuganji. Confused, he asks why Panda doesn't fight, but Panda reveals that he's not like humans and their behaviours do not blind him. He understands that Gakuganji was on good terms with Masamichi and these orders probably came from the higher ups. Even so, Panda sheds a tear for his father and tells Gakuganji to remember that even pandas cry. Which is just like too damn sad man, rest in peace big Masamichi you absolute goat. Anyway anyway, now we skip away to the absolute brutality that happens over at the Zenin household. Like oh my lord you guys are not ready for what is about to happen if you have not seen this moment. You are going to literally freak, it is so good, our girl, oh let's get into it. So in order to fulfil her role in helping with the culling game, Maki returns to a place where she's never felt welcome. As she enters the Zenin household to collect the curse tools, she is immediately greeted by the misogynistic Naoya. Seeing how scarred she is now, he taunts her as he believes all Maki had was her attractiveness. And now that it's gone, he asks if he should mercilessly bully her like he used to in the past. He continues to throw abuse towards our girl, however she just ignores his crude ass and heads on underground. After descending some of the stairs into the underground corridor, Maki finds her mother awaiting her there. She reminds her daughter that they cannot enter the warehouse, to which Maki, like the boss she is, nonchalantly holds up their keys while saying that Megami is the new head of the clan and gave her permission. In a flashback we find out that Maki was actually the person who revealed to Megami that he had become the head of the clan. Heavily reluctant with the idea of being head, Megami suggests that he let Maki take over for him instead, but she denies the option as she knows no one would accept her. She points out that he's inherited the Zenin clan's prized 10 shadows technique and achieved its domain expansion. Megami really didn't want to take the role as head and asked if things like acceptance mattered if she becomes the clan head. She would still get the resources, but Maki doesn't believe she's good enough to make this home a place where Mai belongs. Not yet. Once Maki said that about her sister, Megami finally understood. In the present, as Maki cruises past her mother, she's suddenly screamed at by her to stop and instead come back. Maki's mother asks why her daughter is always like this and tells her to at least make her mother proud once for giving birth to her. However, Maki just completely ignores her pleas and continues on until she finds a door that seals the cursed warehouse. After using the key to unseal the chains holding their doors together, Maki finally enters. However, she's instantly shocked to see her father unexpectedly sitting inside of the room without a single curse tool in sight. Maki's father, who was another of the misogynistic lot, reveals that he anticipated Maki's move and emptied out all of the curse tools beforehand. He stands up and reveals Mai's injured body behind him. Mai, seeing Maki there for the first time, calls her an idiot for coming. Which is really random when you put it in that context. Meanwhile, Junichi meets with Naoya to fill him in on the circumstances. Junichi explains to Naoya that Megami is the better choice for the clan head because of his good relationship with Satoru Gojo and Noritoshi Keimo. At the same time, Junichi refuses to allow an outsider to inherit the entire fortune. Naoya asks why they don't just get rid of him, but then Janichi explains that they can't do that. Killing Megumi outright will hurt the Zenin clan standings with the other Gojo and Keimo clans and they would fall behind in the power vacuum left behind by Satoru. Naoya asks why they're doing it now, if that's the case and Janichi explains that they're going to take advantage of the notice from Jujutsu headquarters. It's explained there through them that it's been deemed a crime to unseal Satoru Gojo. So the Zenin clan is going to execute Megami, Maki and Mai as rebels plotting to do so. Naoya is amused by the plan and while killing his own daughters will boost Ogi's credibility, Naoya wonders if he is actually okay with the idea. To which as the battle begins between father and daughter, Janichi reveals to Naoya that this plan was originally Ogi's idea. Which just goes to show like how fucked up the Zenin clan is and how old all of their thoughts are. Like look at the house, the woman, the men, the clothes, like literally everything. It's it's time to move forward Zenin clan, you just, you guys just do not get it. Like don't get me wrong, I actually love it because that's the whole point of the sect in a way, to make you hate the group while still wanting to know more about all of them. Especially Naoya, like that dude is just written absolutely perfectly. 
Back as the battle starts off, Oki activates his Falling Blossom emotion. He explains that he kept Mai alive as a bargaining chip in case Maki arrived with any unknown curse tools that caused an emergency situation. Maki wields Juzo's masterpiece, the goated curse tool, Dragon Bone. Its effect or ability I guess is that after accumulating cursed energy, the user can inject it out the back of the blade to increase its cutting power. Maki plans to take advantage of Ogi's ignorance and bait entering a single strike duel while actually intending to hit back multiple times. Just before ending the standoff, Ogi asks why Maki thinks Naobito was chosen over him as head of the clan. Maki asks if it's because he's a terrible person, willing to kill his own children, which instantly prompts Ogi to start the fight. As Ogi darts forward, she blocks his first slash and follows up with an attack of her own, utilizing the momentum granted by cursed energy shooting out the back of the blade. Ogi tries to parry but quickly notices his katana blade is actually broken, allowing Maki to get behind him and go for the finishing blow. However, with some unrealistically fast timing from an old timer, Ogi quickly spins around and counters with his blazing curse technique, momentarily solidifying his blade before he cuts Maki down. Maki's already busted eye is again hit and cut open along with her lower abdomen which was sliced through from the attack. Left with deathly injuries, Maki doesn't understand what happened until she realizes that Ogi's blade has been replaced by the flames of his cursed energy. As she falls defeated, Ogi sheds a tear and reveals he couldn't become head of the clan because his children are indeed worthless. Man, I, like I said, I hate the Zen family's ideology and like Jujutsu in general. Like if you wanted your kids to improve, you would teach them techniques and not treat them like absolute ass all the time. It's not Maki who's the failure in this like situation, Mr. Ogi-san. It was your failure as a parent to teach your children correctly and guide them. And now, it is time to pay the consequences. As Ogi drags his twin daughter's bleeding bodies down a corridor, leaving a trail of their blood behind him, he explains why Maki lost. He says that she stepped in close and treated her opponent like a swordsman and not a sorcerer. He repeats that he did not become head of the clan because of the quality of his children. Naobito's projection sorcery technique doesn't have much of a history outside of passing it down to Naoya, so this was not a determining factor in the choice. The only difference between them was how strong their children turned out to be. Ogi states that children must not hold back their parents and tosses his daughter down a flight of stairs like the trash he thinks they are into an empty, large room. He explains this area is for training and discipline. A plethora of cursed spirits are kept there that will eat the twins as soon as Ogi leaves. He mocks Maki and claims her heavenly restriction is nothing compared to other sorcerers who trained and reinforced their muscles with cursed energy every single day for years on end. Her father then turns his back on his daughters and says farewell to the stains of his life one final time. Before the curses move in, Mai is able to sit up and puts Maki's head on her lap. As she feels Maki's heart beating, she notes how tough her twin truly is. Okay, I used to hate Mai, but like, really in this moment, right here, it fully changed my total outlook on her. I always thought that she was just another of the Zenin household, content with the way things are, and that's why she was always a bitch towards Maki. But right now, we find out that Mai suspected that this would happen someday, and is ready to do what is necessary to save her sister. She opens Maki's mouth and says, this sucks, before breathing the life back into her. Suddenly, Maki awakens somewhere on a beach as if she's been rescued from drowning. It's just like so cute. Literally like she breathed the air back into her after drowning and the crap from her family. Like it's, it's such a great analogy right here from Gege. She's laying next to Mai who explains that she's going to use her construction technique to make something but will then die from the strain due to the injury she's already sustained. Mai gets up from the sand and walks into the water while saying goodbye and wishing her twin good luck in life. This greatly confuses Maki, who gets up and begs her sister to come back. Mai explains that she knew for a while that twins are a bad omen for sorcerers. To gain, one must give. However, that rule doesn't always apply to twins because cursed energy treats them as one singular entity. Even if Maki wants to get stronger, she can't because Mai doesn't. So as sad and as messed up as it is, as long as Mai is around, Maki can never fully develop. In an attempt to get her sister to stop, Maki tells her that she understands, but she still doesn't want to lose her sister and runs after her, asking for her to come home again. 
Maya extends her hand to Maki, telling her that she is only going to leave her one thing, so make sure to throw the rest away. Maya will take away all of the accursed energy when she dies, so in return, she asks Maki to promise her just one thing. Destroy everything. Maki takes a small reed from her sister's hand and reflects on the time they were happy as children. In the next moment, hell itself has returned, as Maki awakens in reality, noticing that she's holding a sword handle instead of a reed. In a moment of beauty, she's being protected by her sister, who has tragically toppled over her with no more life left in her body. Overwhelmed by emotion, Maki cries out and tells Mai to wake up while a bunch of cursed spirits rush up behind her. Skipping over to the old man as he walks away, he notices something that just doesn't feel right and turns around to see what's up. Suddenly, all of the cursed spirits are exorcised instantaneously, confusing Ogi as their presences just vanish for him. Okay, like, remember, our girl is now outputting zero, nada, none, literally no cursed energy at all in her stuff. It's just them pure gains. Time to see what really pays off. Physical strength through training your entire life, or cursed strength, Ogi? Ogi readies his katana and sees Maki strolling through the shadows of the doorway before she gently places Mai's body down. Ogi's body begins to tremble with fear as he knows his mind has tried its best to forget this feeling. Maki emerges from the shadows and instantly reminds him of no one other than the demon warrior who possessed no cursed energy, the breaker of fate himself, Toji Zenin. Struck with a jolt of fear, Ogi immediately activates his curse technique, blazing courage, coating his katana's broken blade and scorching flames that blaze a circle around him. With his scorching blade pointed at Maki, Ogi threatens to burn his worthless child to the bone in a fight to the death. However, before he could even finish talking, Maki, like the freaking beast she's always been, effortlessly decapitates his head while walking past him. In fact, I don't even know how much of a specific buff this was, like we have to get big old broken Ronin on it or something, but this slash was so damn fast that Ogi never even saw it coming. Maki stops behind her father's defeated corpse as it falls to the ground. She looks at the last gift Mai gave her, then ready to keep her promise, grips the curse tool in her hand and tells Mai it's time to get started. Time to start the absolute destruction that is about to happen. Like, oh, I can't wait. Ding, ding, ding literally like as an alarm bell sounds out notifying the Zenin clan, Junichi and Naoya leave their meeting room and go into a hallway. Young Ranta Zenin finds them and tells Junichi that Maki has gone mad and actually killed Ogi, which leaves the others completely surprised. So since the Zenin clan is like just freaking massive, they have a variety of different groups consisting of people with varying skill levels. One of these is the 50 man Kukuru unit that gets dispatched to apprehend Maki. Following in the pussy ass way of every Zenin male, this captain, Nobuwaki Zenin, tells his men that she must have killed Ogi in his sleep or in the bathroom, obviously severely underestimating her strength. This Kukuru unit is made up of Zenin men who do not manifest an innate technique, but are still able to use cursed energy. They end up fighting Maki in the cursed spirit room and surround her with at least 20 men from the unit. Standing there alone, looking like the complete hellhound with the dragon bone in one hand and Mai's creation in the other, Maki can only think about her sister. She wonders what her plan was and if she should really have given up on becoming a sorcerer alongside Mai. She figures that that might have been the right answer all along and apologizes to her sister for putting her through all of the pain that she did. From around her, the 20 Kukuru unit fighters all attack while Mahi remembers Mai's final request. Destroy everything. Maki opens her eyes just as one of the men attempts to slash her. Instantly, and on some freaking matrix level shit, she avoids the blade and cuts off both of the man's hands in one fluid motion, then vaults over his back and cuts down several of his allies before finally beheading the fodder fall below her. Despite their numbers, the Kukuru unit is frankly nothing compared to the now unrestricted Maki, who effortlessly kills one after another in successively brutal fashion. Oh my lord, I love this fight, like the look on everyone's freaking face as she's just annihilating them is perfect. This absolute egg, Nobuwaki, arrives back, somehow expecting Maki to actually have been finished off already, yet as he strolls in, he's unpleasantly surprised to see that all of his men have been turned into bloody corpses by an unscathed Maki. 
Suddenly, our new beloved icon of female strength notices a surge of cursed energy nearby, coming from Chojuro Zenin. Instantly, she's tossed flying up into the air by a pair of gigantic stone hands that then attempt to smash her while she's falling back down to earth. Nobuwaki recognizes this attack as Chojuro's curse technique and notes that the Hei have now arrived. Which by the way is a group made up of only the strongest comprised of everyone in the family with a semi grade 1 or higher ranking. So now the proper fight begins. The stone hands aren't enough to hold Maki as she tears her way back out. Nobuwaki and Chojuro attempt to stop her but she jams her hands into their throats at blinding speed literally killing them both before they could even react. Ranta watching this uses his paralyzing technique to try and hold Maki in place while yelling for Junichi to hurry up and finish her off. While Junichi sprints in to kill her, Maki fights back and forcibly breaks out of Ranta's technique. This literally sends his technique back at him or something similar to that inflicting a horrendous amount of damage to his face. Still, despite bleeding profusely, Ranta makes sure to tell Junichi that Maki has indeed become just like Toji. However, unlike Toji who never decided to destroy the entire clan on a whim, Maki will do that if she is not killed here and now. Junichi attacks Maki and launches a huge number of cursed energy propelled fists raining down from the sky at her. This pummels everything in the immediate area which causes Ranta to believe they actually succeeded at his final moments. Ranta then collapses on his knees while they smile thinking they won and succumbs to the previous strain of his injuries. While Maki, the complete and utter god, walks out of the dust and smoke with Junichi's head hanging from her fist. Finally, the misogynistic Naoya Zenin, who secondly, under being an absolute hoe as the head of the Hay Squad, confronts Maki via a small traditional Japanese style bridge that extends over a nice pond. Standing there, he of all people calls Maki cruel and asks if she even has a human heart. To which Maki with a cold and callous face replies no, as her heart has already been taken from her. Skipping into a flashback during Naoya's childhood, we find that he had always been wrapped in cotton wool and constantly praised by his family members. He was recognized as a genius and many always believed he would grow into the head of the clan after Naobito. Love how Megami just showed up on the block out of nowhere and messed up that entire plan for him. Anyways, anyways. Naoya heard of a black sheep in the clan who didn't have any cursed energy and went to see how pitiful that person was. However, after seeing him, Naoya was physically shaken upon seeing Toji's cold yet unconcerned concerned eyes. Back in reality now, Naoya initiates the fight, quickly sending a series of rapid punches towards her. However, Maki is able to parry the majority of them while trying to count the number of movements in that singular moment. Sadly, while she's big braining his technique, Naoya interrupts it and grabs her, causing her to be frozen inside a frame. Then using the extreme velocity his technique provides, Naoya kicks Maki through several stone structures surrounding the area. Naoya standing there thinking he is the top G is adamant to himself that Maki is not Toji regardless of her new boost in power. Yeah she ain't even at the same power level yet bro she just unlocked the full extent of her heavenly restriction like Goku wasn't all of a sudden Super Saiyan 3 when he unlocked Super Saiyan 1 like it's not how it works you, got, you, got, you still gotta train and build time you know. Anyways Naoya thinks that the sin of insignificant people is their ignorance of strength. Everyone misjudged Toji because of his lack of cursed energy and Naoya doesn't believe anyone other than Gojo truly understood who he actually was. Using his curse technique, Naoya continually builds up momentum and overwhelms Maki with one high speed move after another. Being a massive Toji and Gojo fanboy, Naoya desires to prove that he is the only one who will stand with them as one of the strongest, not Maki. Even with her improved abilities, Maki is starting to get hurt by Naoya's attacks and struggles to keep up, admitting that the situation is getting bad. For Naoya, unlike in his fight with Choso, he won't stop building up speed this time. He understands that strength equals weight and speed and plans to pierce Maki at max velocity, having already gone supersonic. Maki gained a steel body that is broken away from cursed energy in exchange for Mai's life. She welcomes a head-on collision and takes the stance of the Shirinui Gata, which for all of my Japanese lovers out there is a specific form that sumo wrestlers take. Maki attempts to take on the brunt of Naoya's supersonic speed in order to stop his movements, even if it means sacrificing a few ribs. Appearing to see through Maki's defensive strategy, Naoya tags her with his palm. In doing so, it forces Maki to follow the 24 frames per second rule of projection sorcery. 
failure to do so means being frozen inside a frame for one second. Like what just happened with her previously when she was kicked across the yard. Still moving at top speed and seen as adversary as nothing more than an imposter, Naoya believes Maki is frozen and prepares to finish her off. However, Maki actually isn't even phased by his technique and is even obeying the specific 24 frame rule of it. Now being able to move fast enough, Maki turns around and counterattacks, intercepting Naoya's path with her fist. Naoya attempts to call Maki a fake, but before he finishes, she smashes his face into the ground with a monstrous punch that ends the fight and deforms Naoya's skull. Now acting like the absolute boss she is, she looks down on her pathetic bloody cousin and asks him to repeat that. So I guess all of the action in regards to the Xenon Clan mutilation ends there, but we still have just one more massive moment I probably should chuck in here for all of you guys, because I oh my lord, it wraps everything up just perfectly. Having left the battlefield now, Maki finds her mother in a kitchen area. Like of course, like where else would she be in a Xenon household? It's just so, so freaking sexist of them. Maki's mother tells her to stay back, but Maki wants to know why she screamed at her to come back earlier in the corridor. Too distraught to even recall what happened only moments prior, Maki's mother can only ask what Maki is talking about. Dissatisfied, Maki approaches her mother, who yells out in panic several times before her blood is splattered on the wall. Okay, I'm not gonna lie, this does confuse me a slight bit. I think Mumsy turned the blade on herself right here, but honestly, let me know what you guys think down below. I, I really don't think Maki actually sliced up her mum. Outside throughout and around the estate, the Hay and the Kukuru squads have been completely decimated, with their corpses lining the area. Somehow, like the cockroach he is, Naoya, heavily injured but still somehow barely alive, walks around, pouring blood from his face until he finally collapses through a door onto the ground inside. He mocks Maki for not ending him and leaving him like this, when out of freaking nowhere, Maki's mother walks up behind him with her throat already slit and bleeding, so she's definitely approaching death for sure, but still somehow holding a kitchen knife, typical Zen in a state like thing. Naoya, who's currently too pitiful to even protect himself, then is probably the woman he hated the most, the mother of Maki and Mai, stab him through the back with a goddamn kitchen knife. Which by the way is something that this dickhead said should happen to any female who is weaker than any man. So like, oh my god Gigi, you gotta chill out with them sneaky little like uh, foreshadowings here and there. Naoya calls her a piece of trash, but either way, ends up dying a pitiful death with a woman laying on top of him, unable to do anything about it. On top and fading away, the girl's mother admits that she really was glad to have given birth to two amazing girls. After absolutely ruining the entire Zenon family tree, Maki exits the property with Mai's body. Momo arrives just moments later, having been chasing behind Mai in concern. Seeing now that Mai has died as a result of not being there to help, Momo cries and sobs over her regret. Silently, Maki hands over Mai's body, to which Momo asks Maki what she's going to do now. But our girl, still obviously shaken, remains completely silent as she walks away with the blade in her hand. Later on, it is explained that the Zenon clan members who were not even present at the estate that day also died violent deaths. Maki literally hunted them all down in one day and killed them all, it's crazy. No residuals were found other than trace amounts from a cursed tool. Skipping back now to the moments before leaving Tengen, Yuji and Megami were given the third and final third year's location, that being the gambling madman Hikari Kinji. It is explained that Hikari is currently just chilling out while being suspended and makes money as a bookie for an underground fighting club. This Brad Pitt level fight club pits sorcerers against one another in hand to hand combat. The spectators are mostly non sorcerers, which just goes to show that Hikari literally doesn't care about the Jujutsu regulations. Now arriving at a parking garage, the two sorcerers remove their Jujutsu uniforms in an attempt to try and trick Hikari into thinking they aren't associated with the school. Megami goes on to say that he may not associate with them if he realises they're also students from Jujutsu Tech. It's a grey area for them, but to Hikari, they might as well be with the higher ups if he finds out who they truly are. Yuji wonders though if Hikari will actually help, to which Megami is unsure. Regardless of the situation though, they need his strength for the culling game and will do their best to recruit him. Megami and Yuji walk into the entrance of the parking garage and are met by two men. The security guard looking dude tells the kids to get lost and instantly throws a strong hook at Megami. However, it stops just short right before hitting his face. 
As the security guard slowly pulls back his fist, he tells Megami that the one rule of the fight club is that nobody is supposed to say anything about the club. He demands to know who told them and threatens to beat him up after finding out. I honestly love this whole idea with like Hikari being like a Brad Pitt type character having this fight club and everything. It makes me feel like Gege is a part of the generation that I grew up as a part of and watched these movies while I was growing up and just really enjoyed them and everything. And now we're getting to see, you know, like his little enjoyments from Western culture plopped right into his story here, which is absolutely fantastic. Megami claims not to have gotten the person's name before he killed them himself. It was a cocky sorcerer that disappeared about a month ago. To which the guy recalls some dude who disappeared about a month ago but is unable to verify who it was exactly. Megami asks to take his place instead and threatens to murk the bodyguard if he refuses. The manager then gets a message from the boss to add an additional fighter to today's tournament. However, only on the condition that Yuji is selected as the fighter. Knowing that Yuji is perfect for the job, Megumi keeps up his act and asks that he fight instead. The dude explains to Megumi though that the boss doesn't like him and refuses to let him fight. To which Megumi, having noticed all of the cameras around them, decides to happily accept the invitation. Dude is out playing like some 4D level chess trying to trick everyone, including Yuji at the moment. Like, Yuji's probably just standing there utterly confused. <laughs> After leaving and confirming that Akari must have been observing them through the cameras, they go over the plan. Firstly, Yuji is to look for and make contact with Akari on the inside while Megumi attempts to sneak in the parking garage from outside. Obviously this is hella risky because if they discover Megumi sneaking around, they will probably instantly distrust Yuji. So if they are discovered, they decide to use force to make their way through to Hikari, but only as a final resort. Even though the best course of action would be to let Yuji do his thing first, Tsukumi's deadline is fast approaching, which causes Megami to get a bit reckless. It's currently 5pm on the 10th of November, leaving the group 9 days to rescue Tsukumi before the deadline closes. That evening, Yuji returns to the parking garage for the fight. The man there preps Yuji by explaining the details of how the tournament works. There are only two rules, no retreating and no jujutsu, which obviously big Yuji is completely fine with as the dude was first and foremost a physical beast. Anyways, anyways, now heading down the stairs towards the arena, Yuji asks the dude what the boss is like, to which he says to Yuji that he can only find out if he actually meets him. He then explains that there are two types of matches, scripted and unscripted ones. These so-called scripted matches are actually script written by the boss, and if Yuji is able to put on a show in an unscripted fight, it will likely get his attention, possibly resulting in some kind of meeting. Arriving at the arena now, which is like this dope section of the garage where the upper floor has been almost entirely renovated into an area that allows spectators to view from above, Yuji is introduced to his opponent, someone that I can 100% say surprises absolutely like everyone here, e even rereading the section I forgot this beast made his appearance here. With that good old fighter announcer voice, the infamous John Bobby begins the tournament by introducing the newcomer Itadori against no one other than Panda. In a monitoring room somewhere nearby, chilling like the absolute king he is, Hikari sits with his associate as the fight begins. He expresses his displeasure as he believes things are starting to cool off. Hikari doesn't believe there is any fun in knowing who's going to win an unscripted fight. He doesn't think anyone will be able to defeat Panda and is barely watching. However, the lovely lady with him points his attention over to the television where Yuji is absolutely pummeling Panda in spectacular fashion. By the way, for those wondering, like the comment says just above, I'm pretty sure Hikari and Panda obviously know each other and are probably extremely well on that like classmate level type beat of friendship. Back in the fight, Yuji and Panda work together to put on a show that entertains everyone watching. In fact, the fight is so damn good it impresses even the GOAT himself, John freaking Bobby, who screams that this is the best fight he's ever seen. While the two trade blows, Yuji and Panda have a cheeky conversation to exchange info. Panda has been allowed into the fight club, but Akari and the other cute third year with him are actively avoiding Panda as well. After finishing their small conversation and agreeing to end the fight, Yuji lands a powerful fake body shot that Panda sells with a way over the top reaction to convince everyone that he's been defeated. Big Bobby announces Yuji as the winner, leaving a lasting impression on everyone watching. Even Akari upstairs in his little content box admits that he's impressed with Yuji's ability to fight in three dimensions while still dazzling the spectators. He calls one of his managers and gets him to bring Yuji up to his office. He wants to strike a deal with him while the iron is hot and writes scripts for Yuji's future fights. 
This chick chilling nearby, who turns out to be another of Jujutsu High's third years, called Karara Hoshi, tells Akari that it all just sounds boring to her. Elsewhere, at the same time, Megami, like the sly mofo he is, uses a dude's shadow to eavesdrop on the conversation without being seen. The man on the phone asks Sakari what to do about the other brat, referring to Megami, who's like <laughs> right behind him, to which Sakari says he plans to have Karara keep an eye on him. After leaving the area, Panda finds Megami in a nearby forest. He asks Megami if he thinks that Yuji will be able to contact Hikari, to which Megami thinks that he will, but asks Panda why he actually hasn't seen Hikari himself. Panda knows where Hikari is and says that he's in the monitoring room on the roof, but can't get close to the door because of the Hoshi girl's curse technique. It doesn't matter what he seems to do, walk or run, he cannot approach the door. Megumi asks if it's only active when Karara is in the monitoring room, but Panda is unsure since she's always with Akari. Rather than forcing the issue, Panda attracted spectators to avoid getting on Akari's bad side. He goes on to say that he thinks Yuji's charm will work on Akari, but is also apprehensive because Yuji is an extremely bad liar, as we all know from literally every time this dude has had to lie about like anything. So in an attempt to save his ass, Panda gave him some tips beforehand, just in case something random happens. Worst case scenario would be for Hikari to discover Yuji is with Jujutsu High and boot him out. Panda wants to secure the area and monitor the door to prevent this, meaning that they'll need to merc a few of the fodder security guards to get up there. He knows where all the cameras are and their blind spots, as well as the positions of all of their lookouts. Megami acknowledges that they might have a solid plan, but Karara's technique remains a random factor in everything that they do. So if Hikari and Karara do end up getting Yuji outside the door, Megami says that they'll just have to give up on their objective altogether. Later on, and after winning another match in the fight club, Yuji sends Megami a text at 12.58 saying that he's meeting with Hikari at 1pm. While each of the five lookouts maintain their positions, Karara nicknames him Yu and shares that Hikari had to repeat a year in junior high. Yuji notes how cheerful Karara is, to which she replies it's because Hikari is starting to feel hot again. Having received the text, Megami sneaks into the first guard's shadow and mounts him from behind. He chokes the man unconscious, tapes his mouth and zip ties his hands together, all done extremely quickly. The second guard then walks in without noticing a single thing is amiss. Megami quickly slides into his shadow, then continuing on the UFC style takedowns, he knocks him out with a perfect triangle choke. At the same time, two other guards notice Panda playing with a tire. Initially confused, one of them wonders if he eats fish sausage, while the other recognises Panda from the tournament. Suddenly, Panda switches on them and knocks them both out before taking the sausage then heading up the emergency stairs. Panda regroups with Megami on the roof and moves with him to guard the monitoring room door, when suddenly and unexpectedly, Karara walks out of the room just below them. For a moment, Megami and Panda just stand there completely stunned. Looking up, Karara quickly notices the pair and instantly makes the connection that Megami and Yu are both from Jujutsu High, like Panda. Karara, believing that Hikari is in danger, reaches for her phone and tries to contact him. However, Megami summons his beast of a Shikigami, the divine dog, Totality, to try and stop her. The Shikigami rushes Karara and tries to restrain her, but it's sent flying back into Megami. Having dropped her phone, Karara runs towards the monitoring room, while Panda, who's kind of just standing there, tries to explain that they're not enemies. Karara doesn't believe that they have a simple request for Hikari and is upset with him for simply betraying them. Due to Karara's technique holding Panda back, Megami orders his divine dog to intercept her path. This instantly stops her, but Megami is also suddenly pulled towards his Shikigami. He realises that in addition to being unable to reach Karara, he is now unable to even separate from his divine dog. While he thinks about how this curse technique works, neither he nor Panda have noticed a small, random star symbol on Panda's ass that reads, Star Am I. Like, oh my lord, bring back Professor Diavolo from the One Punch Man video. We got some space facts here, boys. So Am I is actually a star in the Milky Way. Am I is also like the traditional name of the star known as Delta Cruxes. It is visible from Earth and is only 364 light years away. Or if you want that in miles, it's about 2.139 quadrillion miles away. Anyways, meanwhile, inside of the monitoring room, Hikari, the final special grade student, finally meets with Yuji for the first time. In typical Jujutsu Kaisen fashion, Hikari hits him with a bizarre but intriguing question. He asks Yuji, would you believe me if I said you could work for one hour a day and make one million yen a month? Unsure as anyone would be in the situation, Yuji just blankly stares back in confusion. 
Confused, Yuji asks what he would need to do, but Akari says he would have to pay him 200,000 yen. Obviously like a cheeky guru scam right here. But you know what I like a lot more than materialistic things? Knowledge. Knowledge. The more you learn, the more you earn. You know, I read a book a day not to show off, it's again about the knowledge. knowledge. In fact, something happened that changed my life. I bumped into a mentor. Like, yeah, okay, dude, totally. I'm sure that's how it actually works. Even Yuji, out of everyone, doesn't agree as he thinks that this all just feels kind of shady. Hikari agrees and points out that it's a classic con where get-rich-quick scammers sell tips. It's an obvious scam, but Hikari notes that there are still a lot of people who will fall for it and adds it up to something that he calls the fever. Hikari explains that both the scammer and the scammed are in a fever to change their lives. People get high on the fever and make stupid decisions, yet without it, people can never fall in love. Hikari loves the fever and asks Yuji if he knows the most direct way of engaging with it. Dude, like, Hikari is such a, such a tricky character to get around and like write and stuff. Yuji guesses correctly and says that it's gambling. I find this like part absolutely hilarious, but apparently lots of girls dumped Akari in the past due to his constant gambling, but goes on to point out that life itself is actually a gamble. Society tramples on losers who don't know when to quit, but Akari points out that everyone gambles. What people truly hate is losing. Hikari goes on to say that he wants to control the fever of the entire country using his fight club. Which is really like the fight club movie if you think about it. Like Hikari's character in general is really playing on that Brad Pitt side of uh, the main character's brain and everything. He's going for that like I want to change the entire world prospect or like the entire world feeling. He says that he wants to take advantage of the current chaos and expand his business, making the Jujutsu headquarters aware of his ambitions. Needing strong allies for this, he asks Yuji if he wants to get high on his fever. Yuji prepares to ask for help when all of a sudden they're interrupted by a phone call which completely changes the atmosphere. After it ends, he offers Yuji a drink which he refuses because of his age. Hearing this, he brings up out of the blue that Sasuro Gojo can't drink either. Yuji pretends not to know who Gojo is, but Akari, who finds this suspicious, finishes his drink and asks if Yuji is a spy from Jujutsu Tech. Before Yuji can speak up to defend his case, Akari tosses the drink glass right at his face. Yuji deflects the cup, but Akari quickly activates his curse technique, summoning two tall sliding doors that attempt to close Yuji between them. Yuji jumps above the horizontal doors and tries to speak up, but Akari continues his attack, trapping him with his doors and kicking him in the face, while revealing that a call from Karara means something bad has happened. Yuji recalls what Megumi said about only asking for cooperation and headbutts Akari in an attempt to get him to listen. However, the third year doesn't give up and refuses because now his fever is running cold. Meanwhile, outside the room, Karara is in a deadlock with Panda and Megumi. Since they are stuck, Megumi tries to explain that they're not on the Jujutsu High side and they need Hikari's help, but Karara just doesn't listen. Confused as to what happened between them and the higher ups, Panda explains to Megumi that conservative members of the community prefer traditional Jujutsu while Akari has blended his with technology. So just think of the moment during the Shibuya incident where Mimiko and Nanako got absolutely murked by Sukuna and he was like, ooh, a cursed camera technique, cool. That was a blended technique as it had been like blended with the camera and the cell phone. Karara points out that Jujutsu Hai lost because they have their priorities backwards, but adds that they always have Gojo to clean up their messes. So why are they even here asking for help? Megumi reveals to her that Satoru Gojo was sealed during Shibuya, but Karara makes a face of comic disbelief as she obviously just can't believe that that could ever happen. Realizing this, Megumi decides to activate his rabbit escape, summoning dozens of his rabbit Shikigami. As a large swarm of rabbit Shikigami cover the roof, he notices that each of the rabbits are marked with a symbol saying a crux. None of the rabbits can actually get near the monitor room, where Megumi notices another symbol, Star Gat Crux, has been placed. The rabbits quickly spread across the entire roof so that Megumi can see where and where they can't go. Seeing this, Karara repels them but is still confused at the whole point of it. Karara's innate technique marks Shikigami the same as Sorcerer's, so just like with the Divine Dog, Karara believes that Megami will attract all of the rabbits and suffocate inside of them. However, he suddenly dispels them all. Megami asks Panda how Rabbit Escape was, to which Panda confirms that the Shikigami were attracted to him and the second floor, but they couldn't reach Karara or the monitor room door. 
Panda finally figures out that he has been marked with his symbol, a Mai, and Megami has been marked with a Crux. Megami isn't sure what's going on, but he knows that Karara's curse technique is very likely based on the constellation of stars. Karara notices that Megami is figuring out how her technique works and puts her attention on him. Megami turns to Karara and says that it might be based on the Southern Cross constellation. Karara is surprised that he guessed correctly, but gives it away that he got it correct with her reaction, which continues to add to her frustration. Karara knows that if Megami continues to figure out how the technique works, then it'll eventually reach the monitor room. Karara resolves to hold him off and try to prevent that no matter what. Megami thanks Sukumi for teaching him about the Southern Cross, but is still confused because he knows it should have four specific points. Megami and Panda get close to one another and discuss Karara's curse technique. He initially thought that it assigned them each a point on the Southern Cross to maintain distance between each point. However, this can't be the case because Karara can approach the door and Megami can approach Panda. Megami realizes that it's more likely that the curse technique has a determined route where there is a sequential order for who can go near what depending on what point they've been marked with. Panda considers that the technique doesn't affect the user, but Megami debunks this because the divine dog Totality couldn't approach Karara earlier. If Karara and the door both had stars that repel Megami and Panda, then Karara could simply flee. Megami and Panda surmise that this must mean the Southern Cross has five or more points, as if there were only four stars, one of them should be able to approach the enemy sorcerer. Since that isn't the case here, there must be a fifth star between them that they must go through in order to reach her and the door. Panda asks what they should do if there are six or seven points, but Megami says five is already too many to make sense for a cross. Obviously though, if you live in like NZ or Australia, or even pretty much anywhere in the Southern Hemisphere, you know for a fact that there are actually indeed five stars in the Southern Cross. Anyway, anyway. Knowing that she might be foiled soon, Karara goes on the offensive. She ferociously jumps on the hood of the car and marks it with a Mai, sending it flying up at Panda. The car flips into Panda, but he manages to catch it and assures Megami that he's okay. While Megami runs away, Panda tosses the car away from him, to which Megami concerned reminds Panda not to throw the car away or else the mark will simply attract it back to him. And as he says this, the car comes shooting right back at Panda, slamming directly into his head. While sprinting, Megami surmises that contact needs to be made by the user to place a star. Karara marked Megami by marking his curse energy through his divine dog. In order to mark more objects like the monitor room door or the car, they need to be charged beforehand with someone else's curse energy. Honestly, Megami is just so freaking big brain right now. If he had the raw strength of Yuji, dude would actually like be pure insanity. Anyways, anyways, Megami focuses on seeing the curse energy residuals on the car and finds some from someone other than Karara. Continuing with his theory, Megami assumes the technique doesn't have a long range and eventually finds a parking stop marked with a fifth star, Mimosa. Megami quickly touches the parking stop and doesn't notice any more residuals. He knows Karara's cursed energy is already marked with a star, so he assumes they can't use their curse technique to mark another object with a crux and attract more objects to him. However, to Megami's shock, a bunch of objects marked with a crux are already heading directly for him. Finally, it is explained that Karara's curse technique, Love Rendezvous, marks five stars with a Southern Cross motive to target curse energy. For one star to approach another, it must follow a determined order, or else one of the targets with the same star will attract it. The order follows the stars from nearest to furthest. On a diagram, constellations come across as flat, but space is actually a three-dimensional area, and each star is a different distance from Earth. Megami was marked with a crux, so he must travel through Mimosa and Ganan in order to reach Gokrux, or in my monkey brain speak, he has to go through the parking stop mark, then Karara, and finally he can make it to the monitor room door. Anyways, anyways, Karara admits she's impressed that Megami figured out how her technique works. That being said, Karara believes Megami was too quick to conclude that more objects couldn't be thrown at him. While Karara can't mark more than one star with the same icon, she can simply remove the monitor room door marker and mark other things with Megami's motive instead. Suddenly, Karara is caught off guard when the divine dog randomly reappears behind her. Megami's jacked up Shikigami quickly immobilizes Karara, confusing her until she comes to the realization that Megami never dispelled it. Instead, he was able to guess which one would attract the other and maneuver so there was a wall between them. Then after waiting for a while, he unjammed the divine dog from the wall so he could take advantage of the fact that Karara was now approachable. With Karara now stuck, it forces her to release the love rendezvous. Megami quickly restrains Karara so that she doesn't run away, but simply asks her to listen to what he has to say. 
He then dispels his divine dog totality, or simply asking her to listen. Still skeptical, Kraut doesn't think Megami could have known whether he or the Shukigami would have been pulled. Megami admits that he took a gamble, but now he knows that the one with the higher curse energy output does the attracting. Initially, the divine dog pulled Megami, but the opposite occurred when Megami reinforced his body with cursed energy. Megami then lets Kurara go and begs her to listen, because there's frankly just no time. Confused as to why he would release her, Kurara decides to believe him. However, the monitor room door is suddenly sent flying off its hinges with Yuji bursting out. Megumi quickly realises that Yuji has been hit outside the room and right on cue, the fighting fiend Hikari walks outside, visibly irritated with the whole situation. Yuji tells Megumi and Panda to stay out of it, prompting Hikari to believe that he's being underestimated. He immediately throws a devastating punch that smashes Yuji's face and sends him flipping across the roof. Hikari eventually notices that Yuji isn't even resisting and in that moment, the first year springs back to his feet. Standing there, Yuji spurts blood out of his nose while Hikari is just blown away, noting that his adversary doesn't even intend to dodge. To him, Yuji's lack of resistance all but confirms he's not a spy, so Hikari says that he'll hear Yuji out on the condition that he can remain standing and flares up his curse energy. Kurara urges him to listen, but Akari claims that he just said he would, before asking Yuji why he's asking him for help specifically. Yuji says that all of his seniors have confirmed Hikari is strong, annoying him. Hikari punches Yuji again, and while he's railing through the air, Yuji compares Hikari's reinforced punches to getting hit with a serrated bat. Which like, oh my lord, the cheese greater level of curse energy right here. Irritated, Hikari yells at Yuji, stating that sorcerers understand asking one another for a favour is equal to asking someone to put their life on the line. In order for Hikari to take such a risk, he needs Yuji to prove here and now that he has the fever to convince him. Yuji claims that he doesn't have a fever and is just a cog, a cog in a machine that sorcerers need to eliminate cursed spirits. Typical depresso Yuji right here, like even Hikari finds his answer extremely boring, so he decides to wind up another punch, prompting Megami to express his concern. Hikari strikes Yuji with the hardest blow yet, sending him flying across the roof into a wall and appearing to finally knock him out. Hikari begins to tell them to leave, but Yuji suddenly reappears behind him. Hikari is genuinely surprised and backs up, wondering how he's still standing after suffering three literally mind-altering blows. He asks Yuji what he is, to which he replies with the same answer as before. He believes his function is getting rid of curses, and since Hikari is necessary for that, Yuji decides he won't stop till he agrees. Yuji then gets up all in Hikari's face and asks him what his function is. Hikari, who's still surprised, asks himself if this is the look of a cog in fever. He goes to punch Yuji once again, but finally, Karara interrupts and manages to get Hikari's attention. She asks Hikari if Yuji's fever is burning hot enough for him yet. Standing there, he recognises that Karara's point is undeniable, acknowledging that it is indeed true. He then suddenly agrees to hear Yuji out and tells Megami and Panda that he's willing to cut a deal. Honestly, if you're confused as to what happened, don't worry, because Megami and Panda are like just as confused as everyone else as to what's just happened. He asks Karara if what they said convinced him, to which she confirms. Skipping forward, Hikari finally sits down and listens to what they've got to say. He's completely surprised to hear that Gojo was sealed, and Panda adds that Masamichi also died in a fight with Gakuganji recently after Shibuya. Obviously, this is like the first that they've all heard of Yaga's death as well. Yuji and Megami are concerned for Panda, since Yaga was pretty much his dad. Hikari expresses that he's bummed out now that everyone who's ever taken care of him is out of the picture. Honestly, I think like as in everyone, he was probably referring to Yaga, Gojo, Nanami, and like maybe even Ghetto from the school as well before he passed away. Hikari agrees to help combat the culling game. However, he tells them to not get the wrong idea and makes it a point that everyone understands that this is a deal and that they must return the favour at some point in the future. Panda wants to know more and asks what exactly he desires. But Megami cuts in and comments that he doesn't think whatever it is will be difficult, which annoys Hikari. 
Hikari calls Megami a sea urchin head, or a shithead pretty much, and asks him what he could possibly know, prompting Megami to flex on him, saying that he's literally the head of the Zenin clan. Who starts off and is like, nah, I don't want the role marquee, like, maybe you should have it, and now he's flexing on Hikari right here. Shocked, Hikari finds this even more of a surprise than the news about Gojo and Yaga. He believes that with the backing of the big three families, making revisions to society will be easy. However, the funny part about this is that, like, I just talked about earlier in the video, Maki actually destroys the entire Zenin clan the next day. So her fight and all of that with Mai dying, etc. happens after this point. So I don't know why Gege decided to write this backwards here. Maybe he just thought of that afterwards and thought he'd throw that in just to add a bit more like confusion of the story. So thank you very much, Gege. With everyone in agreement, Yuji states that they need to decide what colony to go to. When suddenly, Kogain, remember like the game interface thingy that was explained right at the beginning of the arc, appears above Yuji and makes a loud ringing noise. Cocaine announces that one player has added a new rule to the game, allowing players to have access to information on other players. This information includes their name, number of points, number of rules added, and their current colony. This rule was added by a new, mysterious looking dude named Hajime Kashimo. A sorcerer who's over 400 years old knows Sukuna and is currently dominating the entirety of Tokyo's number 2 colony. After making the announcement, Kogain introduces itself to Yuji. Its voice differs to that of the announcements, because now it's acting as liaison for the culling game assigned to Yuji instead of the announcers. Megami doesn't understand why Yuji is already being considered as a player before entering a colony, which is actually super interesting, and I'd love to like know what you guys think it could be, but like Yuji, I believe it has something to do with Sukuna, and most likely the fact that Sukuna was a cursed object linked to Kenjaku in some kind of way. Megami points out that that's still strange because Yuji ingested Sukuna's fingers of his own will, unlike the past sorcerers who were in contracts with Kenjaku. So yeah, there definitely is something else going on. What if perhaps it was actually the vow Sukuna made with Yuji, you know, like the one that he doesn't actually remember currently even happened? Just an idea. Yuji has Kogain show him his own player info, and Megami uses the list to find Kashimo, identifying them as the one who added the rule. Megami believes that they can get through the culling game without killing anyone by forcing someone with enough points to add another rule. The two players that already fit that bill are Hajime Kashimo and Hiromi Higuruma. In order to save Sukumi, the first rule they have to add will need to offset rule 8. Megami states that they can do so by adding a rule that allows players to transfer points between each other. After adding that rule, Megami suggests adding another one that allows players to spend points to remove themselves from the game entirely, to which Ikari points out that that might actually conflict with the long lasting rules of the game, but Megami figures that maybe it will work under the right conditions. But ultimately, it's up to the game master, and regardless, the team now has a plan. While they look for the sorcerer known as Angel, they will also search for Hajime and Higuruma, then attempt to take them down for their points. So that officially brings us to the very end of what is Jujutsu Kaisen's perfect preparation arc. And obviously this arc in general is absolutely massive in terms of just the information that gets given to us in regards to the culling game which is going to be going on in the next arc finally. So we are actually going to be getting into that along with like all of the fights there. And you know like just Maki's massacre and like her destroying her entire clan in general leaving only her and Megami as a part of the Zenin clan or like I guess Zenin and Fushiguro clans left. You know that's all that's left over from the clan and technically Megami is the head of a headless clan, like I said right at the end of the video there with, you know, Hikari. And you know, like finally, we were actually introduced to Hikari here, which is an absolutely dope character. I never expected him to be such an interesting character, and most likely based off like a Brad Pitt-esque type character from, you know, like that entire fight club scene. Especially with his entire fight club and wanting to change, you know, like the Jujutsu society, it fell that way, to me at least, anyway. Obviously, if you guys have enjoyed this video and want to see more stuff just like it in the future, then make sure you hit that subscribe button and also be sure to leave a like on the video as it really helps out with pushing my stuff to a bunch of new amazing people and of course we are like almost at 100k subs we're only 9k away now which is like freaking amazing so if you do watch all my videos and stuff then do make sure to hit that subscribe button and smash the you know like the bell alert so that you do get all my videos when they first you know release and everything but anyway for now it's been your professional degenerate dear volo and i will see you all in a bit bye